Hello guys, welcome to Chasing the Murderer Talking News. I want to ask you guys to please take a moment to subscribe, hit the like button, and hit the notification bell. So, we are moving forward guys in this very awkward case. Probably one of the biggest case that I've ever known. And that's Life Beyond the Grave, the Lori Vallow case. We're working our way towards 2007. And in 2006, things are really heating up between Tylee Ryan's parents. So Joseph Ryan and Lori Vallow, because now she's married to Charles Vallow. Lori has made some very serious accusations against Joe Ryan, saying that he has abused the kids in many ways. So physically and sexually. And in August 18th, 2006, he has petitioned to modify child custody and transfer the case to Travis County, Texas. Today, we're going to learn a little bit about a man by the name of Alexander Lamar Cox, born to Barry and Janice Cox, January 18th of 1968. He is one of Lori Cox's younger siblings, and he's one of the main names in this story. Alex Cox, what we're learning through family, is he's not real close with the family, but he does attend a few family affairs. We know that he's a truck driver, but we also learned that Alex Cox actually has a dream, and that dream is to become a comedian. Yesterday in the mail, they sent me a photo album. on uh, Movement 97.5 and uh, he gave me backstage passes to go meet Britney Spears and I thought that was cool because I never met a celebrity that big and I thought oh, I'll get her a gift because I don't know the proper protocol or anything so I gave her the gift and she was really sweet she's very appreciative but she seemed a little confused by the gift like she didn't know what it was uh, I got her underwear as you can see Alex Cox he's a good looking guy he seems like a lot of fun but most people that associate with Alex Cox will address him as he's kind of strange. Around 2006, when Alex Cox is really trying to make a go of his career as a voice actor and a comedian, he meets a woman by the name of Tracy. According to Tracy, she had actually met Cox in a comedy club in Phoenix. They both did stand up and they became friends fast. She says one night they were in Arizona doing their stand-up routines and she had actually ran into Alex Cox. It was after a show and they walk up to each other and pointed at each other and said, funny. And from then on, they become really good friends. So Tracy said they stayed in contact pretty often, so every day. And one day she was upset because she wasn't able to perform in a show. She calls Alex, and Alex tells her, well, come over here and help me paint this bathroom. She said their friendship grows, excels, and they start hanging out just to write jokes together. Their relationship was purely platonic. And Alex Cox is described by Tracy as being a caring guy. So she thought. And you hear Alex Cox mention in one of those clips that his brother Adam, which is also another name to remember, is a DJ. So I want to go over this with you guys real quick. So here you can see Janice and Barry Cox. These are the parents of these children that stand behind them. To the right is Lori Vallow, the woman that this case is based on. To the left of her is Adam Cox, her brother, the DJ. Then Summer is beside him. And then finally, to the very left, is Alex Cox. So here is another picture of Alex Cox on the left and his sister, Lori Vallow. So here's a picture from one of Alex Cox's stand-up comedian things. I don't know which one. And so here you can see Tracy is on the bottom of this little collage. That is Alex Cox's friend. And she will give us a little bit of background on Alex, especially in the next year. So in 2007, where something really interesting happens. 
So around this time, Lori is tell, sharing stories that Joseph Ryan is abusing the children. But really, Alex Cox's friend Tracy really doesn't know any details at this time about that. She will later have a little bit of something to share with us. But what we're hearing is Lori and Alex Cox aren't extremely close, but they're still in contact. There's a lot of drama going on in Lori's life. And she makes sure that she keeps her mother, especially her mother, in on all that drama that's happened in, in her life, including her sister Summer. Importantly, you know that the drama that revolves around Lori, it never seems to stop. But, believe it or not, we're coming up on the part of her life where it's probably the most quiet pretty soon. Lori is very religious. And her whole life, this religion has played a huge role in her life. So this affected her as a teenager, like I mentioned. And it almost seems like her belief system has created a lot of unhappiness around um, in her life because she's not able to do things that everybody else can do. And I think this is why um, she has made some of the decisions that she makes because it's all based off of that belief system. What's right and what's wrong. What's allowed and what's not. Around September of 2006, Joseph Anthony Ryan is ordered to pay child support. And I found some information where it says that Joe was actually ordered to pay child support for both Colby and Tylee at one time. But what is interesting is on Colby's birth certificate, there's no father listed. And it is rumored that Lori actually changes Colby's name illegally sometime during the marriage to Joe Ryan. Also, around this time, Charles, don't forget, he's very active with his boys and the sports that they're involved in. And so we have an account from Cheryl, who is Charles' ex-wife, on a day that she meets Lori Vallow for the very first time. Cheryl says that she remembers meeting her at her son's baseball game, thinking that she was a nice woman. She says, quote, we were sitting next to each other and she looked at me and said, you probably think I'm an idiot because I'm with your ex-husband. Found that very funny, but that was the only pleasant moment we ever had in all the years that she knows Lori. Because Lori will become a very big nightmare in Cheryl's life, too. A lot of people don't realize that. At first, everything seemed to be fine. Charles and Lori's marriage was going pretty smooth. Actually, his sons would actually spend the night on weekends, summers, and alternating holidays with their mother. But Charles' boys with Cheryl mainly live with Cheryl. But the interesting statement that Lori makes to Cheryl was quite interesting to me. When she asked, you know, I look like an idiot being with your ex-husband. I've often wondered what that ever meant. In between these good times and happy moments, Lori is just very in intertwined in the custody battle with Joseph Ryan over Tylee. But according to Cheryl, they had their cases, their family cases, actually combined into one courtroom. And Cheryl recalls, quote, It was quite odd, but she seemed she loved it. That's when I learned she doesn't do what she's told to do if she doesn't want to. I saw that a lot in court, end quote. And so Charles is spending a lot of money fighting his ex-wife over the custody over his sons. But suddenly, one day, this quits, just stops. And this left her perplexed when Charles and Lori announced that they were moving to Arizona later, which we'll go over. And as I researched deeper into this case, I was learning that Lori seems to love that drama, the fighting, the attention from all that. But what I also notice is if she gets distracted from something that she's had her mind set on for a long time and she's fought with everything that she's had, she will drop that fight and put everything into whatever is happening next. 
I think that is important to remember about, you know, this particular characteristic of Lori Vallow. Lori likes to find the upper hand in any situation that she's in. And even if it makes her look foolish, what I've noticed is it seems to give her some kind of, I think she gets off on that power play. And the thing is, whenever she gets caught, it's not her fault ever. There's always distractions, finger pointing. She likes to have everything revolve around her, but pointing it away at the same time. So everything revolves around Lori, but the blame goes to everyone else. And if she wants something, she will do anything to make it happen. December 4, 2006. A temporary order is put in place, and Joseph Ryan was denied physical access to Tylee, his daughter, until after trial. He's only allowed to communicate with his daughter through telephone, and this, at this time, is supposed to be granted privilege and confidential information regarding Tylee. Meanwhile, they're still pushing the abuse, uh, physical abuse, and sexual allegations on uh, to Joe's Ryan, and I don't want to leave Colby in limbo either um, to let you know that I do believe that Joseph Ryan was most likely bullying Colby, but I'm just not certain about the rest. Regardless, I feel bad for Colby and Tylee. These are, you know, all these children involved with this case. They are going through so much, and it's their parents putting them through it. They can't even have a comfortable lifestyle because of all the drama. Now here, I want to lead you back into the belief system that Lori follows, so the LDS. Around this time, Chad is communicating on the internet, finding people with these original stories and experiences, mainly near death, um, visionaries, people that can tell the future, and signing them up with his book publishing company. So one of those people is Hector Sosa. Hector Sosa was born in Puerto Rico. He inherits visions like his mother. He claims that this is a gift from her. And he, ha he and his whole entire family have converted to LDS. But now he is writing a book and Chad Daybell is going to publish it. The book is basically about doomsday warnings such as earthquakes, plagues, and other repeat disasters of history. And like so many of these people involved with the doomsday, they had this idea of a foreign invasion in this country, and it's coming soon. But their idea of this foreign invasion is they're coming in with guns blazing. The truth is, there's always been threats of invasion, always have been, but it isn't always going to be a physical war. I mean, really, we're kind of facing what I call an economy invasion, where people are purchasing, you know, businesses and land in America that are not of this country. But Hector and them are sending these warnings, and their visions are gifts and warnings to an elite group. At least, that's what they believe, that they are the elite. So Mormons do believe, and I'll go over that in more detail later, later as well, that you can have visions. Anybody can have visions. But this group of people, they seem to believe that God has called them out as a special elite soldier. And they are God's visionary, are visionaries of warning. So God is compelled to reach out to these special beings and send messages to be prepared for the doom and the gloom headed their way. And they are to give out the message to all the other people in this world. You'd think the elite executives of God would have a way to heal and build greater tomorrows for all. Instead, they believe there is a rebuilding of a kingdom of God, which is unlike Jesus. Jesus would often help the lost, the weak, and the needy. He never spent his days 
spreading fear. Instead, he would share compassion. He never walked above anyone. He walked with them. And I never seen an instance where he ever pushed his crown on anyone. In fact, Jesus was merely the Son of God, not a ruler. And I feel that a lot of the people connected in this case, like Julie Rowe, Chad Daybell, Hector, and many others, Jason Mao, they like to feel that they're carrying these crowns, which immediately tells me that they're false prophets with essential appetite to uh, feed their narcissistic ego. And that's my opinion. And for those who want to believe that God is sending messages through other people and not to them directly, they have set their own worthiness aside, basically seating themselves in the back seat. And this back seat is not following Jesus Christ. It's supposed to be a team effort if you're following Jesus Christ, not an ego boosting celebration. And as I research deeper, I noticed that people like Hector Sosa and them, they believe that they have been chosen to lead God's people in one form or another because they're not all exactly alike. Now, a lot of them use the doctrine of the LDS as a guide to their beliefs that they push on to others. People like Hector Sosa, and I really do believe David Warwick believes in what he sees, but they're reading um, doctrine like this. Let's go over a few. Okay, so let's go over some of the doctrine that uh, actually say that some of the signs of end times are earthquakes. So, in Dream Nephi 1, sorry, here's thunderings and earthquakes. Then Nephi Unbelievers will be destroyed in earthquakes. Again, they who kill prophets shall be visited with earthquakes. Jews and Gentiles shall be visited with earthquake. Wars and earthquakes in diverse places. And we'll end with this one. Earthquakes at the Lord's coming. So in Hector Solstice's book, this is one of the things that he pushes. He actually starts to predict earthquakes in the future. And I will show you more on that as we move forward. People like Chad Debo and Hector Sulsa, Jason Mao, Julie Rowe are all hiding in these little forums for people who believe as they do. And they're all starting to make connections and things are starting to happen. We're seeing more books be printed and sold. The subject and days. Though I'm not certain, I would love to know where uh, Tammy is and all this. Tammy Daybell, Chad Daybell's wife at this time. What does she think about end days? Because you really don't see her too much involved in any of these forums or really the books. So let's move back to Lori a little bit. What we know now is Lori's going to live in Austin, Texas for almost 20 years. And according to some sources, she worked at a salon on and off 15 years. And I want to mention, she will be moving to Arizona. And when she does, five years, she works as a director for Broadway Kids as a health instructor. Now, before we get any deeper into the story, I want to kind of do an introductory of Adam Cox. This is the brother to Lori Cox and Alex Cox. And around January 2007, because I really wasn't able to collect a lot of details on this due to the um, how big this case is, Adam Cox is working as a DJ. And one morning, he's working in Sacramento, California, and a 28-year-old woman named Jennifer Strange is a guest on this show. And they're doing a water drinking contest, just to cut it short, because it's not really important. But something happens. After Jennifer wins this contest, she actually passes away from water intoxication. If anybody ever thought something like that could happen. Yes, it can. And uh, she passes away. And this was very devastating to Adam Cox. And it actually affected his life. And in a big way. 
Adam will actually write a book later on this uh, event in his life that was so, it was just horrific for him. Meanwhile, during the custody battle, Tylee Ryan is starting to have health conditions. She's having stomach issues and she will be in and out of the hospital a few times related to those issues. But there's something interesting. According to some information that I found online, Lori Vallow believes that there's a chance that her sister, Stacy Cox, who passed away with diabetes, might be reincarnate, reincarnated through Tylee Ryan, her daughter. So this kind of gives you an idea of Lori Vallow's mindset. This is a little different than what the LDS teach, okay? They do teach something that's similar to reincarnation, but not really in that way. Lori Vallow believes that when you pass away, your spirit goes to, well, there's different places that you can go, in which we've gone over a few um, other places attached to the celestial kingdom. There's three levels. But your spirit can be sent back to Earth. Or, depending on your um, loyalty and faith in this religion, you can grow on to become um, like a god of your own planet and raise new spirit babies that will also have the chance to return to Earth and live a mortal life. Okay, let me go here. So, a lot of Mormons, especially the ones involved with Chad's group, and there's more like him, often they have conversations about after death. Many subjects go over the post-earthly spirit world, or behind the veil. The prophets, who also speak on this subject, try to divert people from talking about ghost stories, devil worshipping, and that sort of thing. But as you will learn, Chad Debell doesn't heed those warnings. He has a whole book written on ghost stories from his experience as a sexton. So the founding father of this religion, Joseph, well, prophets Joseph Smith, declared that the saints should study the purpose of life and death. He says you should actually study it more than anything else. And he suggests that Mormons study this day and night. So this leads me to believe that maybe part of Chad's interest in um, the death and afterlife kind of stems from stuff like that. I literally can make a hundred hour video just on this subject alone. But let's go over some of the doctrine of how the, the Mormons believe um, this spirit world to be. So, Peter refers to the spirit world as a prison. And it is, uh, it is for some, it says. However, it is chiefly a place of learning and waiting, not a place of suffering. And this place is for those who did not have the opportunity and mortality to receive the gospel and those who had partial opportunity but rejected it will be taught this doctrine and given another chance. And so many of the presidents of the LDS or the Quorum of the Twelve, they have general conferences discussing this um, topic and how it works. But it, like I said, there's just so much information. So what they believe is for those that didn't do well, they get second chances. And so these chosen angels, prophets, and this other spirit world are sent to these prisons in order to um, preach the gospel and help these people be able to go back to earth and be given a second chance at mortality and then a second or third or fourth chance to make it into the realm of the celest celestial kingdom. So one of the three levels of that kingdom. And so Mormons like Lori and Chad believe that 
you know, they have many chances. If they don't do right this time, they have many chances to make it right. So, in short, the spirit world is a temporary home of the spirits of all mankind. They are either good or evil. Prophet Joseph Smith declares, The righteous and the wicked all go to the same world of spirits until the resurrection. The main goal is to live in this world of paradise, but what is paradise we don't know. So Joseph Smith says the location of the spirit world is actually very close to us. And during a funeral sermon, he declared that the righteous spirits, quote, are exalted to a greater and more glorious work. Hence, they are blessed in their departure to the world of the spirits. Enveloped in flaming fire, they are not far from us, end quote. A lot of the uh, Mormon followers do believe that they have many people who have been able to visit the spirit world and bring back messages. And if you really want to, you can go online and find so many stories of those incidents. So you have people that have died and come back and they shared stories of being able to go to the spirit world and bring new messages. And many of them saying that, that when they returned, they have met some of their deceased loved ones who are greatly concerned about their well-being and happiness. There's a huge need to bring messages of warning as well. So here's the summary. The spirit world is a place where disembodied spirits go. It is a tangible and substantial sphere incorporated with our earth. The focal point of this massive missionary effort in which we share. It is a world closer than we realize and tied to us by the family lines of many dearly beloved and long gone relatives. And it's from this spirit world that Lori Vallow believes that her sister Stacy Cox is given rights to come back as her daughter. Okay, I'm going to end here for now. But I would like for you guys to take a great look, or long look, at these girls who have been missing for years now. We use popular stories like the Lori Vallow case to help push these forgotten faces. So please, take time to share. Before we go, click the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the little bell right there so you get notifications whenever you have new um, uploads on the series and guys I appreciate each and every one of you and I know I wanted to ask more questions and do some shout outs to some of you guys um, but I haven't been able to really go into the details I usually do I'm doing good to put these out thank you so much guys for being here and watching it's much appreciated and I love you guys to death and I'll see you guys soon